Next on the Pray in Jesus Name show, Dr. Chaps will pray about these important issues. Today we begin a special four-part series on the church history of the doctrine of Christian salvation, a theological study known as soteriology and how we are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. In part one today, we answer the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We discuss how Paul and James may have had two different answers to that question. Former Navy Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt took a stand to defend religious freedom by daring to pray publicly in Jesus' name. Now he helps you by reporting the news, discerning the spirits, and praying the scriptures. Would you pray with us? Here's Dr. Chaps. God bless you in Jesus' name. My name is Chaplain Gordon James Klingenschmidt. You're watching Pray in Jesus' Name. Today we begin a special four-part series, commercial-free, without interruption, about the Christian doctrine of soteriology. Are we saved by faith alone or by faith and works? Two different tracks in church history, and we are going to talk today about the doctrine of Christian salvation. Soteriology, from the Greek word soter, which means savior. Don't get intimidated, it's just a fancy word for salvation the church history of the doctrine of salvation, which tries to answer the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, here's a preview of the comparisons we're going to make, and I'm gonna show you a preview of the next four weeks, and here are some slides. Uh, first of all, we're gonna talk about two different churches. Now, they're both the same church, right? But it's taken two different tracks about the doctrine of salvation. One has evolved through, shall we say, um, the Pauline answer to that question, and the others evolved through the Jamesian answer to that question. But first, we're gonna get into Jesus Christ. And uh, Jesus, of course, is the author of salvation. We're gonna talk about the differences, how Paul followed Jesus Christ, and how James and John followed Jesus Christ. That's in today's show. In part two, next week, we're gonna talk about three different sets of theologians. First, we're gonna start with comparing Augustine, St. Augustine to Pelagius, who was a heretic. We're also gonna compare the Council of Orange, which sided with Augustine, versus Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, and how his conservative theology led to the Catholic ideas of the Council of Trent. Now, you remember the Council of Trent. That's, those are the ones who Martin Luther stood up against. Those are all in part two. We'll talk about that. In part three, which is gonna be in the following episode, we're gonna talk about the doctrines of John Calvin and how he viewed soteriology compared to Jacobus Arminius. There was a conflict there between those two different founders of the church, right? Uh, then we'll compare the Synod of Dort to the teachings of William Law. And finally, we'll get to Count Zinzendorf who had a debate with John Wesley. So in part three, we'll show you how Calvinism evolved differently than Arminianism or, or the teachings of John Wesley. Difference between Calvinists, Presbyterians, and Wesleyan Methodists. Finally, in part four of this series, we'll get into the teachings of Jonathan Edwards versus Charles Finney, two great evangelists that led the First Great Awakening. And also, we'll get into how that helped form the doctrines of modern day Pentecostal denominations, like for example, Assemblies of God or Pentecostal Holiness. Did you know some of those churches follow the Calvinist track and some of them follow the Wesleyan Holiness track? And we'll show finally the debate uh, from the 1980s briefly about uh, Zane Hodges had a debate with John MacArthur about salvation. And what does it mean? How are we saved and what must you do to be saved? That is the main question. And let's answer, ask that question first of all. Soteriology, again, is simply the theology of salvation. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, of all the questions you may ask yourself in this lifetime, and of all the fields of study that you may choose to pursue, whether it's mathematics, history, languages, or science, is there any more important question than this? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Think about it. If you were a great student and you became a genius, let's say in mathematics, but you failed to inherit eternal life, then you could theoretically end up in hell for the rest of eternity. Well, what good did all your mathematics do? Or if you're a brilliant scientist, but you rejected Jesus Christ, and what good did your knowledge of science get you if you rejected the free gift of eternal life that Jesus offers you when he died on the cross to bring you into heaven for all eternity? Or let's say you studied business and you were a brilliant salesman, you earned a billion dollars, and then you died at a very old age, 
People might say, oh, he had so much money, but he didn't take any of it with him. Soteriology there, therefore, is a very important subject, far more important than maybe any other field you, you may study. It's the theological study of the answer to the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Before we get too far ahead, I wanna put your mind at ease. There's a very simple and direct answer to this question. And that answer was given by Jesus Christ himself in Luke chapter 10. Now, whatever preconceived notions you may have had about the answer to that question, whether you believe in faith alone or faith in works or any of the debates, Calvinism versus Methodism, I want you to lay all those preconceptions aside for a moment. And I want you to work with me and pretend that you've never read the Bible before, but now we're going to study the Bible through the lens offered by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave the answer to this question. And if you take a moment, I want you to, whatever you believe, I want you to read the words of Jesus Christ. He answers this question in Luke chapter 10. He is asked by the lawyer who stood up. I'm just gonna read Luke 10, verses 25 to 28. A lawyer stood up and put Jesus to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Do I have to do anything? And Jesus answered him, what is written in the law? How, do you read, how does it read to you? And the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's what the lawyer said, and then Jesus gave this answer. Jesus said, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. In other words, this is how you inherit eternal life. Do this and you will have eternal life. You'll go to heaven after you die. Or maybe eternal life begins right now. But in any case, you've got to love God and you've got to love your neighbor. Now, listen, whatever you've been told by your pastor, by some expert theologian, or even by me, if anybody else tells you any other answer to the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And they disagree with Jesus Christ, then don't follow them. I want you to first get the foundation of what must you do. This is the beginning of salvation right here in Luke chapter 10. And it's so important that I'm gonna read these words one more time. We're gonna back up here again uh, to the Luke 10 slide. And the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Did you know that you have to love God and love your neighbor in order to inherit eternal life? That's not my opinion. This is the teaching of Jesus Christ who said, you've answered correctly, do this and you will live. You do have to do something. You have to love God and love your neighbor. And that's a little different than the spin. We'll get into faith versus works and we'll get into all that. Uh, we'll get into sanctification and, and holiness and whether that's mandatory or optional in later episodes of this. But that is the first question you've got to answer. Now, the lawyer was a little bit confused. So now we're gonna get into the next part of that parable in Luke chapter 10, Jesus talked about the parable of the Good Samaritan. The lawyer didn't like that answer, and maybe there's some of you out there, oh, I don't like that answer. Chaplain, you're crazy. We're not saved by love, we're saved by faith, or we're not saved by love, we're saved by faith and works. Okay, well, we're saved by grace through faith, and this not of yourselves is the gift of God. We'll get into the Pauline answer to that question, but first I wanna get to the Jesus answer to that question. He said we're saved by love, and if you don't agree with Jesus, that's okay. I didn't make this up. It's his words, not mine. But even the lawyer was a little bit confused by that. Well, I wanna justify myself, he said. Here in verse 29, the lawyer asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? He wanted to justify himself, so Jesus gave the parable of the Good Samaritan. Let's read a few words of this. Jesus replied and said, a man was going down to Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among the robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, there was a priest going down the side of the road, and we, when he saw him, he passed to the other side. Likewise, a Levite also came to the place where he saw the man lying in the ditch and ignored him, passed by to the other side. So the priest and the Levite ignored the man, but the Samaritan, who was on a journey, maybe not even a spiritual man, he came upon the man in the ditch, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them and put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. 
On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever you spend, more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? Well, the lawyer said, the one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said, go and do the same. Now this is in context with what must I do to inherit eternal life. In other words, do this and you will inherit eternal life. You know, you've got to love God and love your neighbor in order to inherit eternal life. That's the meaning of the parable of the Good Samaritan. The priest and the Levite, they were religious men, but they did not inherit eternal life. The Samaritan who took care of his neighbor and loved his neighbor, he did inherit eternal life. Do this and you will live. That's the answer to the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, that's not the only place where Jesus used this idea of salvation by love, which is maybe a little different spin than salvation by faith or works or grace or any of that. We'll get into that in future episodes, but let's start with the foundation of salvation by love. You know, there's another very clear parable when Jesus taught about heaven and hell. And it's in Matthew 25, it's called the parable of the sheep and the goats. Now the parable of the sheep and the goats is, is really blatant. I mean, it's obvious. Jesus talks about some people going to heaven and some people going to hell. And you might blame me, oh chaps, you're so judgmental. We don't believe in hell. Well, that's okay. Uh, these are not my ideas. I'm not the judge. I don't decide who's going to heaven. I don't decide who's going to hell. But Jesus taught this parable of the sheep and the goats so that we could understand his perspective, not my perspective, but the perspective actually of Jesus himself, who taught things about who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. Let's read some scriptures from Matthew 25. Jesus said, on the day of judgment, then the king, or the judge, or maybe God, will come and say to those on his right, the sheep, who are going to heaven, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Naked and you clothed me. Sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. So those are the people who are going to heaven, the people who love their neighbor, who took care of the poor, the sick, the hungry, the naked. Those are people, you love your neighbor and you're going to heaven. That's what Jesus means in the first half of this parable, but then he continues. Then the king, the judge, God, will say to those on his left, the goats who are going to hell, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and you did not, and in prison and you did not visit me. Then he will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, the extent that you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous who did love their neighbor, they will go into eternal life. Now that's simply, I didn't interpret that. I just read you the parable of the sheep and the goats. And you may disagree with me, you may disagree with Jesus. You may not believe in heaven or hell, that's fine. I'm talking about the church history of the doctrine of eternal salvation has to begin at least with the teachings of Jesus. And this idea of if you love God and love your neighbor, you're going to heaven. If you don't love God and you don't love your neighbor, you're going to hell. That idea started with Jesus himself. This idea of salvation by love is perhaps neglected and forgotten because the church throughout history has taken off on these two different divergent tangents. And I'm not saying they disagree with Jesus, but there is a, a conflict now. I wanna to talk to you for a moment about Pauline versus Jamesian theology. So if we start with the core of what Jesus taught, of course, Paul is a devout follower of Jesus Christ. And James, who is actually the brother of Jesus, not to be confused with James, son of Zebedee, the, the apostle, or James the less, James Alphaeus, son of Alphaeus, who is the second James. This is actually the third James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote perhaps the book of James. Now, Paul, the apostle, wrote most of the New Testament, including you know uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Uh, James wrote the book of James, but Paul and James, are two different voices in harmony in the same choir. 
I'm not going to suggest that they disagreed with each other, but they did say apparently opposite things about the doctrine of salvation, about what it means to be saved. And we'll get into in a minute here. I just want to draw a comparison here. Here are two brilliant and biblical men. I agree with them both. Uh, they wrote the Bible. They are, you know, pillars of the faith. These are men, and, and I believe the Bible is inerrant. Everything Paul wrote in the Bible is inerrant, good biblical theology. Everything James wrote in the Bible is inerrant, good biblical theology. I want to say to you that I agree with both men, and yet I want to suggest the possibility that they may have said opposite or conflicting things. Now, Jesus is the master. Paul is not God, James is not God, but they both spoke by the Holy Spirit and they said things that have been interpreted over the years to be conflicting with each other. And this lays the foundation for the branch of what, become, what later becomes Calvinism and what becomes Methodism, the difference between John Calvin and John Wesley, the difference between uh, you know, some of the new, even Martin Luther who focused on Paul versus the Catholic doctrines who focused on James. Again, the same church, but two different voices in the same choir. Let's take a moment and look at what Paul taught in Ephesians chapter two. Paul taught this in Ephesians chapter two. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. This is the apostle Paul saying, we're saved by grace through faith, not by works not by works. Very clearly, Paul says, you're saved by grace through faith, not by works. And yet, does this disagree with what James wrote in James chapter two? Let's compare Paul to James. James said something that may be interpreted to be the opposite of what Paul said. Paul said, we're not saved by works. James said, a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. James said, we're saved by works. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's just read James chapter two. Again, I'm not interpreting, I'm just reading. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. You see that a man is justified by faith, excuse me, justified by works and not by faith alone. Justified by works. You mean a man is saved by his works and not by faith alone? If you do a word search for the term faith alone, which became the, you know, the cry of the Reformation, faith alone, there's only one place that that phrase appears. It's in James 2.24, we're saved by works, we're justified by works, not by faith alone. Not by faith alone? Well, wait a minute, didn't Martin Luther, and we'll get into this in episode two, but I'll give you a slight preview here. Martin Luther, who was an Augustinian monk, Martin Luther actually followed the Pauline doctrine of Ephesians 2, we're saved not by works, but he actually dis disbelieved the epistle of James. When you get into the five solas, sola gratia, we're saved by grace, sola fide, faith alone, Gra grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone, sola cre Christ alone, and the glory of God alone. The five solas, these are emphasized by Martin Luther in the Protestant Reformation. There's a conflict here because he doesn't like what James said when James said we're justified by works and not by faith alone. That's the opposite of faith alone. Sola fide is not scriptural. I'm not you know, in, in disagreement with Martin Luther, but it requires a little more interpretation. And J Martin Luther actually said, James is an epistle of straw should be removed from the Bible. Okay, well, that's his opinion. I kind of like James in the Bible. Uh, but Martin Luther disagreed with this scripture, James 2.24, let me read it again. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. This conflicts with sola fide, so it's, there's gotta be an interpretation here. Is sola fide in sola scriptura, let's go back to Martin Luther here for a second, sola fide, faith alone, and sola scriptura, there's a conflict there because I believe in sola scriptura. I'm only gonna base my theology on the scriptures, but the scriptures say not by faith alone, so sola fide, there's a conflict. That's why he wanted to remove James. I don't think we can do that. Let's instead uh, agree with Martin Luther, who was leaning on the Pauline interpretation of this, 
from Romans chapter 3. Man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. In other words, it says apart, it doesn't say alone, but clearly apart from works, right? Man is justified by faith. So did Paul disagree with James? James said not by faith alone, Paul said by faith apart. Uh Uh-oh, there's a conflict. So Martin Luther and some evangelicals today come up with a way to de-conflict, and I agree with this phrase, we're saved by faith alone, but not by a faith which is alone. And let me say that again, we're saved, perhaps Martin Luther was right, we're saved by faith apart, as, as Paul said, or by faith alone, but not by a faith which is alone. That harmonizes the two voices in the choir with James who said, you know, works with your faith, make your faith perfect. You know, even the Apostle Paul in Romans 2 said that we're saved according to our deeds. You do have to do something. It's not only believing. Paul said this in Romans chapter 2, uh, the, on the righteous judgment of God, on the day of wrath and revelation, God will render to each person according to his deeds, according to the perseverance of doing good, doing good, seeking glory and honor and immortality, he gives eternal life. Eternal life is judged according to our deeds, but that flows out of the overflow of our heart. So let's get back to the teaching of Jesus for a minute, right? And we, we've shown the conflict between uh, James and Paul, and, and I think there is some conflict, but it's, it can be harmonized, and I agree with Martin Luther who tried to harmonize that without throwing out the, gospel, the book of James entirely. We need to harmonize those views. One way we can do that is by bringing in a third voice in that choir, which is, John. Johannine theology can inform and and clarify the meanings of Paul and James because John said this, and he taught in John chapter six, quoting Jesus. He said, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he sent. So believing on Jesus is a work all by itself. Of course, what must you do? What's the work that you have to do to inherit eternal life? Well, one way is faith. Faith is a work according to Johannine theology. So this is one way of de-conflicting the difference between faith and works to say that the work of God is this, to believe. Another way John wrote in John chapter four, he gets us back to the original teaching of Jesus. John chapter four, John writes this, Johannine theology. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So this return to the original emphasis of Luke is a Johannine theology of love. We're saved by love. If you love God, you're born again. If you don't love God, you're not born again. If you love God, you're going to heaven. If you don't love God, you're not going to heaven. Setting aside the debate between faith and works, which gets off on entirely different tangents throughout church history, let's return to what Jesus taught in Luke chapter 10. Let's return to what John taught in 1 John 4, that we're saved by love. If you love God, and maybe there's some people out there who don't love God, I don't know. Um, But we are gonna pray in a minute. I want you to begin to self-examine as I as I wrap up here and and show you a preview of some of the things that we're gonna get into in the next three episodes of this, I want you to begin to self-examine your own heart and ask yourself this question, am I saved? Am I going to heaven? Well, according to the teachings of Jesus and John, you've gotta love God to go to heaven. If you don't do that much, and if your heart is not full of love toward God, then I would question whether or not I'm saved, you've gotta self-examine and see, is the love of God in my heart? Do I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength? Do I love my neighbor as myself? And if I don't meet that basic criterion, then perhaps I'm not saved. So I wanna encourage you to self-examine as I, again, give you a preview of where we're going with this. We've just today covered in episode one the the perhaps conflict, and we've tried to harmonize and de-conflict the maybe disagreement between Paul and James. Paul says we're saved by faith apart, or faith alone. James says we're not saved by faith alone. Of course, John is a balancing voice that comes back and says we're saved by love, as Jesus taught in Luke 10. In the next few weeks, 
uh, in the next three episodes rather, we're gonna talk about Augustine who followed the track of Paul. Notice on the left side, these are people who were Pauline theologians. Augustine, the Council of Orange, Luther. They were followers of Paul. On the right side of the page, they're the ones who ended up following James and John. Pelagius and Thomas Aquinas and the Council of Trent. You see the, the Catholic roots there. We'll talk about that in our next episode. Then in episode three, we're gonna talk about the conflict. Again, on the left side, followers of Paul, including John Calvin, the founder of Calvinism, the Presbyterian denomination. The Synod of Dort, who wrote Tulip, Count Zinzendorf. Uh, also on the right side, Arminius, William Law, and John Wesley. And then finally in episode four, we'll talk about and compare Jonathan Edwards versus Charles Finney, the Keswick Durham Pentecostals versus Holiness Pentecostals, and Zane Hodges versus John MacArthur. I'm gonna take a short break, and when I come back, we're gonna pray to close the show. Can I take a moment to ask you to donate today? There are such important battles that we're fighting and winning around the country to defend religious liberty. How much is the right to pray in Jesus' name worth to you? Well, to me, it was worth a 16-year career and a million-dollar pension, which I sacrificed to defend Jesus Christ. I'm asking you to call us today, toll-free at 866-Obey-God, and make a donation. How much would you pay to defend religious liberty? Would you give $10 or $20 or $100? I bet there's some people who are watching who can even give $1,000 today just to help us stay on the air, to broadcast this into people's homes, to organize these petition drives, and especially, we spend thousands of dollars organizing rallies around the country and petitioning legislators. Please call us today at 866-Obey-God and give the best pledge that you can give to defend religious liberty and take a stand for Jesus Christ. We can't do it without you. Please donate today. I wanna invite you to pray with me. Would you take a moment and pray? Father in heaven, I self-examine and sometimes I have not loved you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. So I repent and I invite you, Jesus, to rule my heart. Fill me with your love in Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you on the next episode. Chaplain Klingenschmidt is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy who earned his PhD in theology from Regent University. As a former Navy chaplain, by taking a public stand for freedom of speech and religious expression, and by sacrificing his own 16-year career and million-dollar pension, he was vindicated by the U.S. Congress, who changed the law and restored freedom for military chaplains to pray in Jesus' name. Dr. Chaps not only defended the Constitution, but his petitions have helped change the law in 10 states, restoring freedom to pray in Jesus' name. Dr. Chaps needs your financial support to stay on the air. Would you please send your best donation today? Please visit PrayInJesusName.org to donate online. Or you can mail a check to Pray In Jesus Name Ministries, Post Office Box 77077, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80970. You can also call us toll free right now at 866-Obey-God. That's 866-O-B-E-Y-G-O-D. Please sign up for our free emails at PrayInJesusName.org. Again, that's PrayInJesusName.org.